are live. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Tammy Waliki. I'm the superintendent of schools for the Hempfield Area School District. We're bringing our meeting to you today, our town hall meeting virtually using a Google Meet. I'd like to introduce the individuals who are on our call with us this afternoon. We have Mrs. Kathy Charlton, high school principal. Mr. Brandon Rapp, our athletic director. Dr. Hello. Matt Connor, our assistant superintendent for secondary. Hello. Mrs. Darla Bryant, our supervisor of special education. Mrs. Stacy, I still say no, <laughs> our food <laughs> service director. Mr. Paul Ward, school board member. Mr. Bob Rieger, HR director. Mr. John Barron, elementary principal of Fort Allen. Dr. Lisa Maloney, supervisor of pupil services. Dr. Tony Bompiani, school board president. And Brandon Wagner, our director of IT. Mr. Oh, I missed Walt Edged, our custodial director. And did I miss anyone? Great. Okay, first, um, as we begin today, I just want to share, we had a um, wonderful response. We received over 400 questions. So with the volume of responses, we have decided to record this in segments. So you will hear us pause at points so that we're able to categorize according to the um, classifications that we asked individuals to submit those questions. Um, I want to share um, here initially, our plan has primarily remained unchanged from the end of June. So we are continuing um, to have our plan open as presented. Um, there was a letter I believe written June 26th and Dr. Maloney did an excellent job presenting our plan at our school board meeting this past Monday. So the information that we're sharing today, really I, I, I view these as a lot of questions in regards to the details, parents asking for more specifics. So we're happy to provide that today. Um, as always, I do have to state that any information that we share with you today is subject to change. We are continuously receiving new guidance. In fact, just yesterday, we received more information in regards to student attendance and what can be counted as student attendance and how that is reported to the Pennsylvania Department of Education. There are some questions today that were in regards to um, students attending the Central Westmoreland Career and Technology Center and also in regards to um, our cyber orientation, um, our cyber, cyber program, and our student parking at the high school. There has been information released since the survey went live, so we will not provide as much detail if there was something just released in the past couple of days in that regard. Okay, prior to starting into the questions, I wanna welcome Dr. Scott Learn to our presentation as well. Thank you for joining us. So our first segment of questions, uh, I am going to take the first group and then um, we have others who will be joining in as we talk about questions in, relations, in relation to their department. So the first segment of questions were around the A, B schedule for secondary. And I will respond to most of these and I think um, there are some that overlap. So uh, we'll do our best to respond. There was a lot of duplication. If you do not hear your exact question, it's quite possible that um, it's because someone else will ask it at some point. Dr. Connor, you have a question? I was just going to announce that we'll be recording this starting now, so please be patient with us at, so we can post it on our website in sections as, um, as the questions were asked based on topic. Okay. All right. All set. So this segment is, is, is in regards to our AB schedule for secondary. The first question is, very few high school teachers engaged with their students during the crisis teaching in the spring. What training and or instructions have been given to secondary level teachers in order to make this AB schedule synchronous? In addition, if our state was to go back to a red level of education, will these teachers be required to interface with their students? So we recognize the fact, our, our survey certainly confirmed, and we recognize that while we certainly did our best given the time period, uh, there are measures taken to provide more engagement if we revert back to the red level and also in the AB where students will have virtual instruction. So we will be looking at 
a, a framework, which we will share with you today, where the tools, and you've heard of LessonBot, also using Google Classroom, um, Google Meet, which is what we're using right now, this tool will be utilized on our A-B days, and also if we go virtual, to where there will be interactions. Um, you could hear Dr. Connor um, asking me a question. Um, you will be able to, our students will be able to interact with their teachers in this manner. So we have used the time from the spring and up through the start of school, including our in-service days, which will include training on these tools uh, for our teachers to continue to grow in their learning in order to make the learning much more engaging. Our next question is, for the days when the secondary students are doing their classes virtually from home, how will that day be structured and will they be required to be online for the entire length of the school day? Um, due to the fact that my child, as well as others, will be home alone on some of those days with both parents working, it's important to know ahead of time to discuss those expectations with the child. We want the children to be on the computers. This is for our secondary students. We want them to be on the computers when they're home with their teachers during the time of the class period. Now, we realize that there may be instances where that may not be possible, and certainly we can address those on an individual basis. However, the question that the preceding question really talked about that need for engagement. In order for the teacher to use a Google Meet, such as what we're doing right now, it would require the student to be on the computer at the time of the class period. That way, if there are questions, that way the teacher can respond as well as that student could then interact with his or her peers, either um, the others that are virtual as well as those that are physically in the classroom. The next question, how are the AB assignments determined for the middle school? So first our middle school principals look to see which um, cycle the students would be on if they have siblings that are attending the high school. They also looked at any of their singleton courses. There are some courses that uh, maybe they're um, specific for students who are in the advanced math courses, maybe some students getting some special education supports. So they did look to take a close balance of those classrooms as well. And then any siblings within the school, certainly, I mean, our parents want their children to be attending on the same day. And then the middle school principal spent a lot of time hand dividing the remaining students. So a lot of thought that went into that process. And I certainly thank them for that extra time and effort to divide the classrooms. The next question, if my child is home from school, not feeling well, can he or she still log on and not be counted as absent, even on days when he or she is supposed to be physically in school? Allow us to first say, um, we did receive those new guidelines uh, yesterday from PDE, so we will be taking a look at what that information informs us. At the same time, we want the students to be attending school on their day that they are scheduled to physically be present. We recognize the value of the face-to-face -face teaching. We do understand there are times when a student would be absent for a day here or there. We would still expect them to complete their makeup work and LessonBot supports that. However, we would not want them to choose to stay home versus coming to school if they're feeling well and certainly able. In the event that we have students with extended absences, let's say for example, a student must be quarantined we would then allow that student to participate virtually and have that counted as being present. So this question, it's not something that we plan to do on a regular basis. It would be more for extenuating circumstances. The next question, are the high school students switching classrooms with each teacher, depending if they are A or B? If they are, how will the desk be cleaned between each class? Because high school students take a variety of courses according to their sequence, their um, plan of study. It's impossible to keep them all together, so therefore, yes, they will be changing classes. We recognize the fact that the desk will need to be cleaned between class periods. We will have a cleaning material available in the classroom. We are asking the teachers to assist in the process by being the only individuals handling the cleaning um, spray bottle and putting the material on, spraying the desk, and as students enter, providing them with a, a paper towel that they can clean the desk surface prior to placing their materials. So this is really going to take the support and collaboration of everyone. And for the students, it is a way for them to be certain that their desk as well has been cleaned. We just do not have the staff to come into our classrooms in that brief four minutes between classes and to clean each and every desk. And certainly some of the desks would not be used um, for each and every class period since only half are present but we do wanna be sure that every desk that was used is cleaned. The next question, 
how long is the AB schedule for secondary education going to be in effect? So we are using a phased in approach. We feel this is the most cautious way in order to open our schools because we do not know what's going to happen when we bring all of our staff members and all of our students back into our buildings. So the phased approach provides an opportunity for us to see what occurs with the virus. I cannot provide a specific time period. I will share that we are going to monitor on a daily basis. And certainly if our mitigation efforts are successful, we will, will give consideration to moving to phase two. I will also share that we had an opportunity on this past Monday to share our plan with uh, several medical doctors of Excella Health who provided some input. And we would look to them as well as we consider the number of cases that we have as to when we would feel safe to, um, to reopen into phase two. We recognize some parents want that to be sooner rather than later. So we will certainly continue to keep parents updated in that regard. Next question, how is homeroom time being scheduled since the AB schedule is designed alphabetically? Will the homerooms be split on in-person school days? Currently, high school students are assigned to homeroom alphabetically. So each teacher has been paired with another teacher and students will be divided. We will not have full classrooms for homeroom at the high school. Next question, why rotate the AB groups day to day if they are grouped for two days and you leave Wednesday as a no in-person day for cleaning, you could drastically reduce the potential exposure between groups and allow Wednesdays and Saturdays for cleaning and disinfecting. Our buildings are cleaned and disinfected daily. While EDGIT is on the call and will be providing more responses to questions in regards to cleaning, we do not feel that we need to have a day where all students are virtual for the purpose of cleaning. Our buildings will be cleaned each and every day. Next question, if less students are in attendance because they preferred remote learning or cyber school for the first nine weeks, is it possible for students to attend school every day? Could this be an option offered to families interested in sending their student every day? Our secondary cyber numbers are much lower than our elementary cyber numbers. The uh, number that we have as of today is 136. That's across all four schools. So therefore, I do not anticipate that we will have a large number of students attending um, secondary cyber. So therefore, as we're preparing class rosters with half for day A and half for day B, we do not anticipate having um, additional spaces for students to attend on a daily basis. The next question. Will students stay in their classes whenever possible while the teachers are the ones that switch classes? And again, this could be um, a bit redundant in that we, it is impossible because of the courses. Not all students are taking the same courses at the secondary level. Next, um, and this one I will um, share just because it may be some confusion. Will there be any time for students during Tuesdays and Thursdays while the students are at home to enter the school building for in-person support? So the teachers on the days when the opposite days, they will be instructing students. So we will not be able to welcome students on their virtual days to come into the schools for tutoring. The next question. Actually, this one leads right into activities. So I am going to say, let's take a pause and end the recording for this segment and we will resume for athletics, band and activities. Thank you, Dr. Connor. This segment of our town hall meeting will be in response to questions that have been categorized as athletics, band, and activities. I'm happy to introduce our athletic director, Mr. Brandon Rapp, and also Mrs. Kathy Charlton, who will answer questions in regards to this category. Mr. Rapp? Uh, yes, good afternoon. We've received a number of questions uh, regarding the return to school plan and, and how the A-B schedule for secondary students will impact the participation in extracurricular activities. Uh, and with that being said, many questions focused on middle school students and their associated programs and were very similar in nature. And I think they can best be summarized with the following question. How will after school practices and games for middle school specifically work if athletes 
on the same team or in different AB schedules? And will parents be responsible to take the child if they were on a virtual day? So at this point in time, we will continue to offer middle school sports programs as originally scheduled. We recognize the difficulty that surrounds students' attendance at practice and competitions on virtual learning days, and we'll attempt to address these in three areas. Students will be required to secure their own transportation to the Hempfield area facility where the activity is being held, or to a Hempfield area building in which a shuttle bus or trans is transporting students who are physically in school on that given day. Uh, so if there is an activity at Herald uh, and there may be a shuttle bus from Wendover, parents would be responsible either to get that student to Herald or catch the shuttle bus at Wendover. Uh, and then schedules and more detailed information will be provided by individual team coaches as the season and the start of the school year get closer. Uh, the second area, should students not be able to attend on a virtual learning day, uh, the absence at that activity will not be considered unexcused and therefore will not be held against any student in a negative fashion. And then uh, thirdly, we will be working with coaches and being as creative as possible when it comes to scheduling both practice locations as well as times to accommodate not only the varying schedule conflicts that virtual learning students and families may have, but also to ensure that we're in accordance with the current CDC and Department of Health guidelines regarding gatherings. So please keep in mind that we are working on an attendance monitoring procedure, as Dr. Wilicki had stated, uh, to ensure that those who attend practices and contests were recorded as present on the day in question, whether that be in person or virtual. Another question related to athletics and activities uh, is as follows. Is it being considered to allow a limited amount of spectators to watch our athletes this school year? So currently the guidelines issued by the governor's office and the Department of Health will read as follows. Sports related activities in the PK to 12 level are limited to student athletes, coaches, officials, and staff only. Band and cheer are also allowed in a sports setting, but individuals involved in such activities must count towards gathering limitations and must comply with the face covering order and social distancing guidelines. Visitors and spectators are prohibited from attending in-person sports related activities. So having read that, please know that while it is not a Hemfield area specific order, we're approaching this guideline in two ways. Uh, should the guideline remain in place, we're exploring live streaming options as a means to provide spectators an opportunity to view activities, and we feel confident in our ability to provide this option. Should the guideline change, we will have the necessary procedures in place to allow for a safe environment for spectators and participants. Certainly these guidelines will depend on the updated parameters and recommendations of the Department of Health. And as a final point on that matter, understand that uh, the Hemfield Area School District is working with our governing bodies to ensure that spectators can attend in-person events as quickly and safely as possible. Uh, the last question before I, I turn things back over, um, Will athletes have access to locker rooms after school in order to change for practices, games, and meets? We're currently developing phase four of our health and safety plan uh, to include the sports specific recommendations provided by the PIAA. As part of this process, we will address locker room usage. Certainly as the school year begins, we will need to access locker room facilities uh, and provide those to our students so they have the opportunity to prepare for their upcoming activity. Uh, with that being said, procedures will be implemented to adhere to the current CDC and Department of Health, gu Health guidelines at that time. Uh, and then in closing, uh, if you would have any specific uh, questions related to an individual program, we'll ask that you contact your coach uh, for detailed information. Uh, and that'll conclude my portion of the athletics activities and band section. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to um, Mrs. Charlton and Dr. Wilicki. I'd like to take a few minutes to answer some questions about our activities, pep rallies, homecoming, dances, et cetera. As the guidelines change, we will take a look at these activities and we will schedule these activities as we can within compliance. For example, if we would like to have a school dance and the numbers um, dictate that we still have to minimize groups, uh, we could perhaps organize dances by grade levels, um, by activities, et cetera. So we will continue to plan all of these activities. Uh, we have already addressed the issue of homecoming and our homecoming parade with the township and the 
um, Department of the Pennsylvania Department of Roads, we have to submit extensive paperwork every summer to be able to close down Route 136 to have our homecoming parade. And we have done that because we are sincerely hoping that we will be able, at least in some fashion, to be able to have all of these activities. It's really important to the kids and they have already missed so much. The next question is um, activities during activity period, clubs and various activities. I've spoken to the number of teachers who sponsor the clubs and activities, and we're trying to come up with some activities that can be done virtually. Um, at, as you know, some of the kids will be here on each day, so they would be limited if we scheduled activities on specific days. So we will try to do the best that we can to have many of our activities done virtually so that all the kids will have an opportunity to participate in those. Finally, at this point, um, the, another question is, um, what about activities that we weren't able to have in the fall. And a fine example of that is our National Honor Society ceremony. Uh, we chose not to do that virtually because as soon as we have the opportunity and the numbers allow us to open up our activities and our participation, we are going to have our National Honor Society ceremony and induct our students who are, who are juniors this year who would have been inducted I'm sorry, our students who are seniors this year who would have been inducted as juniors last year. So we will be rescheduling many of these activities as the numbers permit and the guidelines permit. And we will do as many of these activities for our kids as we possibly can. Thank you, Mrs. Charlton. There was one more question in that section in regards to would the students still be able to participate in activities such as field trips and book fairs? These are all activities that we will have to take into consideration as to how can we address the guidelines that are in place at that time. We certainly want our students, as Mrs. Charlton said, to be able to enjoy the activities that they do in a regular um, time period. So certainly we will be looking at each activity individually and giving, cons giving consideration to how we can hold that activity in a safe manner. This is really the time to be creative and to consider how sometimes we can still do things, we just have to do it a bit differently. We will take a pause just um, following this section to ask any board members if there were any questions that you have for Either of the two segments, I, I realized I did not pause after the first, but any questions that you would like to add before we move on to our next segment? Hearing, I, I, have, I have none. Hearing none, we will move to um, end this segment. Our next segment of our town hall meeting will be in response to questions related to elementary, cafeteria, and school lunches. Very important part of the day. We have with us Mr. John Barrett, principal of Fort Allen Elementary, and Mrs. Stacy Moe, our food service director, and they are going to respond to our questions in this category. Mr. Barrett, I believe you are first. Thank you, Dr. Blicky. Uh, first question I would like to address is posed states that uh, will students packing their lunch eat in the classrooms? Um, no. S simple answer is no. Um, students that pack their lunches, it's all going to be dependent on the availability of the school and it will be different between elementary and elementary. Here at Fort Allen, just speaking to Fort Allen, um, the way I have it arranged is grade levels one through four will be eating in the cafeteria whether they pack their lunch or not fifth grade right now is scheduled to eat in the classroom. And this is simply for uh, teacher coverage availability and freeing up staff to help at those times instruct academics elsewhere in the classroom. And I have to thank um, Mrs. Ross over at Food Service for working with me to help me extend the lunch uh, earlier in the day and later in the day to make that work. And again, I'm gonna emphasize, this is gonna be dependent on the elementary school and how and who eats in the cafeteria. 
<clears throat> eating lunch in the classroom, will their desks be sanitized before and after they eat? Desks are sanitized every single day after school. So upon students entering the building, when they enter their classroom, where they will be provided their instruction, they will come up to a sanitized desk. That will be the only desk they are seated at during that course of the day. So at this time, unless something would dictate that desk be sanitized, their desk would not be sanitized prior to or after lunch. And again, you know, circumstances may change where that may need to be the case. What grade? There, you, yes, I'm sorry. Interject, I apologize. The, the spray bottle mm -hmm. with the cleaning uh, material would be available for the student's desk to be wiped though prior to eating lunch. I just wanted yes. to mention that. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, what grades will be eating in a classroom? And how will students maintain six feet distance in all directions in the lunch and the cafeteria since they will need to remove their masks? <clears throat> uh, the cafeterias are set up with either the cafeteria benches or desks. And these are designed to keep students and maintain six feet social distancing all facing in the same direction. And this is the same for all cafeterias throughout the Hemfield Elementaries. Here at Fort Allen, I have the uh, benches, the lunch benches, and we have put red tape at each end, main, uh, maintaining that six feet of social distancing, as well as the benches spaced out, facing the same direction forward to maintain that six feet of social distancing. Will elementary level kids that pack their lunches just stay in classrooms, or will they also go to the cafeteria? Again, that's going to be building dependent on the schedule and the principal for availability to provide um, coverages for teachers for lunches, as well as um, provide teachers to instruct students. So that's going to be dependent on each elementary. Are the kids given trays or desks to eat lunches on? Uh, the pre presentation just said social distance chairs. Uh, whether they are eating or scheduled to eat in a classroom or they are scheduled to eat in the cafeteria, they will have a desk or a cafeteria bench with a tabletop to eat lunches on. They will not just be seated in a chair holding a tray eating um, in any manner whatsoever, no matter where they are scheduled to eat in, element in any elementary building. <clears throat> can I just skip? I know, I'm, I, I know there's a little break here, Dr. Lippi, but I can skip down to the ones down below. Yes, please do. Thank you. <clears throat> How will lunches go for kindergarten and first grade? With us running the AM and PM kindergarten schedule, kindergarten students will not be eating lunch in the buildings. Um, obviously, um, we will have grade level discussions as far as snacks and individual snacks being brought in and those students um, having snacks or availability to snacks in the building, but kindergarten will not be eating lunches in the building. First grade, how they will eat lunch is very similar to what I just described as far as in the cafeteria. Six feet social distancing. Um, we do have signage coming that when students do buy their lunch, they are going to be um, placed on the floor so students know where to stand to keep social distancing through the cafeteria lines. And we have spaced lunches out to allow ample time for students to enter the cafeteria, buy their lunch. They have ample time to eat their lunch as well as exit the cafeteria, giving the staff time to sanitize the lunch lines as well as the lunch tables or desks depending on what building prior to the other grade level coming in to eat their lunch. All right, I'll take over my questions. Um, I have a question here. It says, how will lunch be prepared? Will it get prepared and in in individually covered until students receives it? And will the individual be serving the same meals at all times? Um, lunches will be prepared in the same fashion. We follow all sorts of protocols. Um, the only thing that will be different is a few of the items will be individually portioned. Any items um, that were self-served before, like our condiment stations, are now going to be packets. Um, our fruits and vegetable bars will now be cupped up fruits and vegetables with lids. And we will still be individually serving the entrees. Um, they will not be covered, but they will be maintained and served directly to each student. Um, we have plexiglass in place so that the students can't get anywhere close to the food. Uh, the staff member will individually portion the food and pass it to student. Um, this way it still has the, uh, maintains the freshness and, and the proper um, 
temperatures uh, that a covered meal wouldn't, and they can still choose the types of fruits and vegetables they would like. The next question I had was, will there be water fountains? Will the water fountains be shut off and how will the district provide hydration for everyone? Um, the district has purchased the bottle filler water um, fountains um, that are safer to use. And will elementary school students still be allowed to have breakfast upon arrival? Yes, um, breakfast will be a little later, but we still will offer breakfast. And in the elementary schools, they're going to come down, uh, grab the breakfast items that they would like, and then return back to their classroom to their sanitized desk in their classroom. Thank you, Mr. Barrett and Mrs. Knoll for uh, responding to those questions. We have a few in relation to lunches at the high school and Mrs. Charlton will respond to those. Our cafeteria has been rearranged as the middle school and the elementary school cafeterias have. All of the tables are gone and we have replaced the tables with individual student desks that have been situated so that there is adequate distance between them. Um, the other question that we had is, will there be enough sessions? Yes, there will. Since we only have half of the school at any, any given time, and we have four different lunch periods, we will have plenty of sessions for the students. No one will be eating in their classroom. Uh, they will all be going to the cafeteria. And we do have teacher monitors that will be in the cafeteria to interact with the students, to help them as they need help, and to make things go smoothly in our high school cafeteria. Thank you, Mrs. Charlton. I'd like to mention that the middle school cafeteria procedures will mirror the high school procedures. All students will eat in the cafeteria being supervised by teachers. Thank you all for responding to questions for this category. We're going to pause briefly as Dr. Connor ends the recording so that we can post just this segment of questions to our website. We will return momentarily. Our next segment includes questions submitted through our town hall in regards to cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, and ventilation. Before we begin, I just want to welcome Dr. Jeannie Smith, a board member to our meeting. We now have four board members joining us this afternoon, Dr. Scott Learn, Dr. Tony Bompiani, and Mr. Paul Ward. Thank you for taking time to join us this afternoon. The next segment of questions, and I will turn it over to Mr. Edgid, our custodial supervisor. Good afternoon. Um, reading from the first question, how often will bathrooms be cleaned between use? So there will be uh, restroom cleaning at least a minimum of two times per day, if not more, um, in all of the schools. Um, bathrooms will be cleaned on second and third shift as well as we do our normal cleaning and sanitizing. Second question, will they have to sanitize the school every night? All of our classrooms and schools and offices areas throughout the district are cleaned every day, every night um, with our custodians in each and every school. So um, yes, the sanitizing will be happening every day at the, at the, the school district. Um, is the school going to be sanitized from COVID-19? Uh, yes, uh, the products that we use ensure that um, COVID-19 virus is killed with our um, disinfectant products. Um, there's a question, will school, will school windows and doors be open to the outdoors? And will this be mandatory? Um, in the rooms that windows can be open, if the teacher feels that the window should be open, they can open them. We do have an HVA system that does turn over the air in the in the rooms um, six to ten times per hour so that is well within the guidelines that we have received from cdc as far as air change out in the rooms um, will students have access to hand washing outside of restrooms who will monitor and help them follow through so most if not all of the elementary classrooms have their own um, sinks that will have the hand washing capability. 
Um, also, we will have hand sanitizer stations placed throughout the school that the students and staff can take advantage of. Do you think it is worth one student or one teacher becoming sick and the side effects are not known? Okay. I, if I can jump, jump. jump in on that yeah. question. So certainly we are implementing every possible safety measure that we can to reduce risk. And if parents are uncomfortable, even after hearing all of the safety measures that we are sharing today, we do have the option for cyber. And we hope that any parent who has interest in that regard has been participating in our informational sessions. We'll take a look at our website, view the recordings, and give careful consideration as to what you feel most comfortable. Very good. And then the final question that I have, what chemicals are you using to clean? Are there any health hazards posed from being exposed to disinfecting, cleaning sprays, et cetera, via inhalation or direct contact or regular basis? So all of the cleaning products that will be used during the day by, by either a teacher or a student is a hydrogen peroxide type product, very gentle um, cleaning sanitizer that will be utilized for that. During the, um, when students are out of the building and when teachers are away from the building, we'll be using our, our normal quaternary products that we sanitize the buildings with um, to, be, to be done um, on their shifts and in their sections. Um, all of the MSDS sheets, you can look onto our website, um, HASD website, to, to look at those as well. Mr. Edge, I apologized if I missed it in reading additional questions. Did you mention the hand sanitizing stations? Yes, up in the yes. other question, up in the hand Thank washing you. and sanitizing station. Yeah, yes. we'd be available through our schools. Thank you. And I believe you've addressed all of the questions in this category. I thank you. And I'll pause to ask if there are any questions from any of our school board members in this regard. And hearing none, we will pause so that we can record our next segment separately, which will be in regards to elementary cyber. This segment of our town hall meeting will include responses to the submitted questions in relation to our elementary cyber school program. Dr. Connor will share the questions and responses. Thank you, Dr. Malicki. And uh, first and foremost, I, I just wanted to take a moment and explain that um, I am so thoroughly excited about the offering of our elementary cyber program this school year. There's been a tremendous amount of work um, by our elementary cyber committee putting this together and uh, also a tremendous amount of interest by our families in the program. The school district recently hosted three separate orientation sessions this past week, two on Tuesday and one on Wednesday morning. If you would travel to our district website and give me a moment. And hold on, I apologize. I think I picked the wrong one. Okay, on this page you will see, this is our district website, and if you would travel to our schools down to Hemfield Area Cyber Academy, um, this is what you will see. First, I, I just wanna show this visual I hope everyone can see it. Can someone give me a thumbs up on the meet? Awesome, thank you. Um, here you'll see a, a, a nice explanation that um, our elementary cyber program is designed to be both asynchronous and synchronous with instruction being delivered by our school district teachers and our curriculum. It is different than our secondary program despite the fact it has a similar name, 
it is different in the way it is run. Our secondary program, there are two options for our secondary students that we will talk about a little bit later in our presentation today, but um, I just wanna make sure that that is um, obvious for, for each, everybody to see. Also, um, if you look here on the tab, there are our recorded presentations from earlier this week. The Both presentations, elementary and secondary, are orientations that were held information nights. So um, if anybody in the audience has not seen those and you're um, interested in receiving more information, you can travel there. Getting back to our questions, how easy, easy will it be to trans transition back to brick and mortar if we started out the school year with Hemfield Cyber? At this time, we are asking at the elementary level that all of our parents commit to a nine weeks. The reason for that being that uh, we will be reallocating our elementary teachers to teach this Hemfield Area School District Cyber program. We need time to reallocate that staff, to notify staff, to make sure that we have properly balanced both our brick and mortar classes and our cyber program. So that is why we're asking for that commitment. Um, currently, I've been uh, sending that commitment form to several, several parents, and the deadline is tonight, but please know that I will not be turning off that form until Sunday evening. Um, but starting next week, we will be um, really working on staffing with the Human Resource Department to make sure that we can um, set our teachers up with the proper amount of time and resources to get uh, started um, in our cyber program for the start of the school year. Will there be a flexible option for elementary, i.e. two days cyber, four days brick and mortar? And um, unfortunately, we are not uh, moving that direction. Our goal for our elementary cyber program that it, it is a standalone program, um, standalone from the current COVID situation, the current setup of um, our brick and mortar, we want to be able to offer a full-time elementary cyber program, and that's what we are doing. Uh, okay, this question, if your child shows symptoms and stays home, or if they are sick with medical issues, can they just participate in the cyber school while at home so they don't miss any school, specifically a child with maybe a 504 plan? And that um, that is that would be an issue right away. Uh, as I had just mentioned, our elementary cyber program is a standalone program. It is different from what is occurring brick and mortar. So no, students are not going to jump back and forth. Um, as I mentioned, it's a nine week commitment. And there will be different teachers um, as I mentioned earlier with the staffing. Will laptops be issued to students whose families are not ready to send children back to school? Yes, if, if you sign up for the cyber program, there will be a Chromebook distribution event. Um, students will receive both Chromebooks and materials um, that are needed for the school year. There was a question in regards to internet reimbursement. At this time, um, the district is not planning to reimburse families for internet services. However, you can certainly reach out to um, your school administrator, to myself, if there's a uh, financial need, and we can definitely work with you, um, similar to what the district did in the spring. This question is interesting, and I'm, I'm not sure how to best address it. Um, it's more about a financial um, issue of, of how much money um, is lost per student. With so many children using cyber school, what is a breakdown of the money lost per student? Um, and quite honestly, with students attending Hempfield Area School District cyber program, there is not a loss of funds to an outside cyber competition, um, which is a great benefit to not only um, our students because of the great quality instruction they will receive, but also a benefit to our taxpayers uh, because we will keep our taxpayer money here in uh, our district. If a student comes into the building at the start of the school year, but after two weeks or so, um, decides it's not working for them and they're asking, can they switch to cyber? And at that point, um, quite frankly, it's easier to switch out from brick and mortar to, to cyber because we'll have our teachers and our classes established. Um, obviously, we'll be looking at class sizes, but uh, yes, we expect that, uh, that ability of parents and students to be able to transition out to cyber um, much easier um, as like I described 
um, earlier. Next question, will there be an asynchronous option for cyber? At the a elementary level, um, no. We are really striving to have more synchronous sessions um, for families. As Dr. Ruliki indicated earlier in our presentation, um, one of the things that we learned from the feedback from the parent survey this past spring is that there was a real desire to have more synchronous learning, live learning um, from our families for parents. Now, I understand that that does not work for all families, all parents, um, but that was what we, um, based on that survey results, the majority of people, and that's how we designed the program and what we want to have offered to them. How will things like gym, music, art be structured in a cyber setting? I can honestly say it'll be structured very similar to what it would be in a school setting. Currently, our students in brick and mortar receive uh, itinerants that those subjects, art, music, band, choir, et cetera, on a six-day rotation, one day out of that, that six-day rotation. That is our desire um, and design for our cyber program. It will be done in an asynchronous fashion, so please know that, but it will still be offered one day out of that cycle. Interesting question here. Who will deal with our children mental status and or problems caused by COVID-19 because they can't see their friends and have socialism they desperately need. This directly goes back to why we are asking and, and trying so desperately to develop this so there is synchronous sessions because we want that interaction. We want those morning meetings, afternoon meetings, if you were able to watch our orientation sessions. Um, in fact, Mrs. Pollack demonstrated one um, with the parents and had them participate. We want that interaction so we can check on our students and make sure they feel involved in part of the classroom and part of that community. Also, please note that all services available to students in the school are also available to our cyber students. Our school counselors will be available to them. Our SAP team will be available to them. Who will be teaching? Um, in our cyber program, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our staffing will be reallocated after this commitment deadline so we can um, make sure that we allocate staff appropriately. And there are a lot of questions about this deadline, and, and I please, I hope under, people are understanding of as to why we made the commitment when we did. Um, we really need to make sure that we are notifying our staff in a timely fashion. And one final question in my section for elementary cyber, cyber is if my child, I'm sorry, if my child cannot log on on a specific time for live sessions, do circumstances allow that there will be an alternative way? And obviously, um, yes, there will be exceptions made and um, there will be recordings made, et cetera. We really want to allow for that synchronous interaction of students and, and teacher. Um, when possible, but there's also asynchronous time built into the day. We do not want students, and we, we understand students sitting behind a computer all, the entire day um, is not good for them, not good for, for us as adults. So um, please know that there are um, breaks built into the day. Thank you, Dr. Connor. At this point, we'll pause for any questions. I have one, Dr. Willicke, just for uh, clarification. I don't know if I understood the question correctly about the cost of cyber school and how much we lose. And I know Dr. Connor, I think I heard you refer to what happens when a person has been enrolled in our cyber school. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to, I don't think right now we would, it would be appropriate to be talking about what we lose to other cyber schools. But if that's part of that question, we can answer some of that on Monday night, if that's okay with you all. Thank you. At this, point, at, at this point, we will pause for the recording and then we will begin another recording for our next segment on secondary cyber school. Okay, so this begins our presentation on 
secondary cyber school, and I will attempt to answer the questions that have been provided in this, this section. I've made the decision alongside my students that they will go to full Hemfield Cyber until schools open back up in phase two. How will we go about switching them back to attending school when the time comes and how far in advance will we be notified that that change is happening? So there's a two part question there, right? Um, one being um, about the switching from phase one to phase two. And I believe Dr. Rolicki answered that um, earlier in her presentation that it'll, we can't predict um, how that will go. So, um, but switching back and forth at the secondary level from our cyber program, um, HACA, into brick and mortar, is it's much more seamless uh, because students are enrolled in their brick and mortar classrooms in their brick and mortar sections. So how would that happen? That would come with a, um, basically a simple notification to the school, to the school counselor, and then um, we'd move forward um, by making that switch probably within the, the next few days to allow the teacher and a school to accommodate that. Can a student leave brick and mortar to Hemfield Cyber at any time? I've heard the reverse in presentations, and I think a lot of that is um, because the difference between elementary and secondary. So again, I wanna clarify, at the elementary level, we're asking for that commitment, a nine week, and it really is because of staffing. At the secondary level, there are two programs that we're talking about. HACA, and there's Ingenuity. So Ingenuity, it is an asynchronous program, meaning that it allows students to really travel at their own pace. Students are asked to commit for a nine weeks in Ingenuity. HACA students have the ability and they are traveling with their, um, their students in the brick and mortar at the same time through their sections of, of instruction and there's flexibility to go back and forth, but in ingenuity, there is not. It's a nine week commitment. I hope that makes sense. I think when we're trying to give options and flexibility to our parents, sometimes it confuses things because of the different choices. So I'm hoping that makes sense. Will the cyber program be different than the previous school years? Uh, yes, yes, that is very much so. As I showed in the visual earlier, um, there are two different programs at the secondary level. One is Ingenuity, which is what has been um, offered in previous school years. And one that is HACA, which is our um, new program that is really mirroring the instruction that's happening in brick and mortar just through a uh, virtual platform using Google Classroom. In the spring, there were several times that we could not get into our real time classroom meet session. It kept timing out even though we have high speed internet. Is the system prepared for extra, extra demand on all of these online students? What steps can we take, such as making sure Chromebooks are fully updated? All of our technology will be fully updated. Um, I can speak um, very confidently that our tech department is working um, overtime as we speak, making sure that all of the Chromebooks are being processed, updated, cleaned, um, et cetera, um, to make sure that um, we have the best technology that our students can, can um, possibly get to make sure that this works smoothly. Um, in regards to Google Meet and whether or not there was something at home that was wrong um, with that real-time classroom Meet session, I, I, I'm not sure about that. I don't know if I can speak to that. Um, but please know that we have um, done a lot of training, as Dr. Walicki indicated, our entire teaching staff, um, both at the end of the school year and also um, plans for this August around these platforms to make sure that um, our educators are, are more informed uh, as to how to use these resources to hopefully um, help eliminate some of the issues if, if that was the cause of this. How does a hacker program work? Will classes be available using lesson bot every day? Are the classes in real time? And how do students who do not physically attend school receive the materials or papers they need? So a lot of this was described in the information session that was offered this past Wednesday for the secondary level. And as I previously mentioned, that recording is linked to the district website under schools under Cyber Academy. So you can find it there. 
However, um, the classes will be available using LessonBot in Google Classroom. Are the classes in real time? Yes, yes, they are synchronous, and we are expecting that um, that occurs. As Dr. Oligi mentioned, um, there are some attendance components that we want to make sure that our students are engaged completely um, in their instruction, whether they're with us in brick and mortar, whether they're at home. How do we enroll in HACA if we choose to ascend cyber schooling? So there's been a process for all this. Um, if you go to the district website under Cyber Academy, you'll notice there is a pre-registration form for either elementary or secondary students. Any parent who completed that pre-registration form either level had a follow-up email, email from either me or Mrs. Lang, our secondary cyber coordinator, with further information. That information includes the commitment form, which is what we're using um, to determine student enrollment. And will it be possible for students to take a blend of traditional cyber school classes and lesson bot classes? And I think that's just a misconception of what lesson bot is, uh, because as mentioned earlier, that technology is one of the tools that will be used in Google Classroom to help deliver our cyber program now. And I think that concludes my portion of the secondary cyber questions. We'll pause for any questions from our school board members. And hearing none, we will move to our next, um, we'll pause for our recording. Our next category is regarding face mask. And this category received, I believe, the most questions, certainly a lot of interest. So Dr. Lisa Maloney, our supervisor of pupil services, will respond to the questions in this regard. Dr. Maloney. Thank you, Dr. Vilicki, and good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to begin this segment by sharing my screen. We had a lot of questions regarding face masks. And sorry. we had a lot of questions regarding face masks, and we have a lot of differences of opinions regarding face masks. And so we have people who believe and want us to know that, um, oh, here it is, that face masks, they do not agree with them, they think they're unhealthy, and then we have people who believe that the children should be wearing face masks all day, uh, even in phase one. So I wanted to kind of give a little understanding around our thought process with face masks, and I did link here the Education PDE's website regarding face masks that kind of goes into great detail about the, the mandate that was given on July 1st and then how it affects schools. So you can see that it was updated on July 6th and then again on July 17th and then again on August 5th. So what I wanted to kind of get into, the face mask does apply to schools. I'll jump down here. I, I think we had several questions about the type of mask that people, that students can wear. And I want everyone to know that we're, we're not, we want something that covers the nose down through the chin what it looks like uh, as long as it's certainly within dress code appropriateness we have no problem with it that was another question somebody had about dress code we certainly you know regarding this got these guidelines here they they can't they don't have we don't want n95s obviously and we we would prefer something that goes around the ears we will provide face masks in the school if a student does not have their mask for whatever reason they forgot it or they lost it or it broke we will have those in the school setting and i'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes so really the mask itself uh, we, we're pretty open to the masks that are out there currently this is the key point so what we're saying is if in phase one of our plan our students in classrooms will be socially distanced by six feet at least. So we are saying in phase one of our plan, our students are not required to wear masks while sitting in class. And here's, here's why. 
as long as students can maintain six feet during during school, they can remove their masks, eating or drinking, seated at desks, or engaged in any activity. And then you can also see the last says that wearing a face covering creates an unsafe condition in which to operate equipment. So also we have students who have, have an identified disability under IDEA or through the Rehabilitation Act of 504, 504 Rehabilitation Act. And I'll get into that in a question in a few minutes. And also just that we have to have this in our health and safety plan and it has to be, as you see, it has to be indicated for all students and staff. So I wanted to kind of go over that so that you can see that we're under the guidelines of PDE. So when we think about what we want to do for our students, it has to align with that. Our students in phase one will be six feet apart, so they will not have to wear masks in class. They will have to wear masks in hallways, on buses, in any congregate space where they are together. In our phase two, as long as the mask mandate is in effect, they will have to wear masks in their seats. So hopefully that helps. We have a question about what's the outline, what can I outline the procedure for mask enforcement? So one of the things I wanted to say was a student who is an, with an identified disability, and that's either through a current 504 or an IEP, they can get a medical documentation from their doctor and give it to the school. If, if So the, right now we're in summer, so really our school principals are on site right now. Our middle school and high school counselors will return next Friday, the 14th, and then our elementary counselors will return on the 21st. So once that medical documentation is in hand, can be given to the school. At this point, I would say to the principal up until those times when the, the counselors are back. And a child who does not have a current 504 or IEP, again, needs medical documentation. And then that same conversation needs to occur either with the building principal or the counselor regarding that child's need for an exclusion of the mask mandate. So I just want to mention that we did meet with Excella, and I know Dr. Willicke had mentioned this, and we talked about it at the board meeting on Monday. We discussed that the doctors at Excella actually indicated that there's, there's a small number of, of students or small number of disabilities that would really preclude the use of masks. And so one of the questions somebody had was, what about shields? Are shields okay? And the answer to that question is yes. We would prefer masks in any event because according to those Excella doctors, they are better and safer. They just, they work better in keeping the virus under control. However, we will accept shields. Shields are acceptable. So if a child needs a shield versus a mask, that's perfectly fine. We just ask that the shield go below their chin and kind of wrap around the head. So it's not something that comes out. And so, and you do not need a 504 or an IEP to have a shield instead of a mask. And Mrs. Bryan is actually showing you what that looks like. I don't know if you can see her on your screen. Thank you, Darla. Yes, perfect. You do not, another question somebody had was, what if, if you wanna wear a shield over a mask, is that okay? Absolutely. Do you need special documentation? You do not, you do not need that. Um, so that, I think that was the shields. The next question asks about, already answered the shield question, um, the exemptions. And like I said, the exemptions right now are under um, IDEA or 504. The question actually asks, are there face mask exemptions for religious beliefs or liberties? And the answer to that is not at this time. We do not have any information from PDE or a Department of Health that that would preclude a child from wearing a mask. This next question asks, and it's kind of a long question, in phase two, desks will be three feet apart, children will need to wear masks every day. I'm concerned about this phase. As an essential employee, I've continued to go work on site. I wear a mask when I'm in communal areas, but not at my desk. I think wearing a mask for extended durations will be difficult for children, particularly in elementary. I think children will need mask breaks. Does the district have opportunities for the children to have frequent mask breaks? I'm also concerned that if the order is lifted, then children will not be required to wear masks. If the masks associated with coronavirus are minimal, then this seems reasonable. However, if there's current concern with coronavirus, while there is risk for children, 
may be generally low, many children are around people who are high risk. If they are not required to wear masks or have children who are not wearing masks properly, then you may be exposing families to the virus. If HASD moves to phase two and children are not required to wear masks, can you transition your child to HASD cyber at that point if you still have concerns with coronavirus? So we will, regarding the mask, we will always follow mandates and guidelines by the governor and Department of Health and PDE. And I believe in listening to Dr. Connor, if you are in brick and mortar school and you want to go to cyber, that is a pretty easy transition. That's correct, Dr. Connor? Okay, good. I just want to make sure that was correct. I also just want to mention that as we begin in phase one, keep in mind we will have children coming from different experiences with masks. We will have some children who are very comfortable with masks. They they use them often. And then we will also have children who whose parent who for whatever reason they don't wear masks often. Maybe they, they're not in communal areas very often. So when children come into our buildings, there may be a teaching component and a learning component on the part of the child. So I, kn I know there's a lot of concern and questions regarding uh, consequences for not having a mask or consequences for not wearing a mask. And it's important to note that, as Dr. Balicki said Monday evening, this is a new rule we're expecting our students to follow. And just like any rule, the first thing we have to do is teach the rule, show the expectation, understand maybe why the child's not complying, is it true non-compliance or is something else going on that we need to take a look at? And again, that goes back to that 504 IEP exemption, but also to really just understand what's happening and try to support the child as much as we can. Somebody asked the question of when students take their masks off at desks, where will they put them? Are they going to have more than one mask if they're taking them off and getting them dirty? So systems will need to be developed for children, especially our younger children, regarding where they're going to put their masks. I have seen lanyards where children are putting their masks on the lanyards, which uh, have breakaway lanyards, which is a great idea. And also your, your older students are going to need systems for what to do and what do they currently do when they have a mask and they take it off, where do they store it? And maybe they need to have a Ziploc bag to put the mask in while they're in class. These are the kinds of things that we're gonna have to figure out and, and come up with good systems and ideas for our students. Masks can also, the other thing I want to mention is in phase one, we allow students to take their masks off within six feet, but that doesn't mean they have to. They can certainly keep their masks on for the duration of the class. And when we met with the Excella doctors, they actually indicated that that would be preferable because even though your distance if somebody coughs or sneezes, it, it could put a student at risk. So we just, right now the distance is, is good and it follows the guidelines, but certainly kids can keep their masks on as much as they want to. So somebody asked, because face masks are such a polarizing subject and each teacher may have their own personal opinion, is there anybody going to make sure that teachers enforce face mask, face mask usage once the kids are inside the room? My concern is that some teachers may take the approach, not the battle I want to fight. So this is a state mandate. And of course the teachers will be trained on how to, how to address when students don't have masks on. And, and again, this goes back to just simple rule following and expectations and positive reinforcement of when kids are doing what we want them to do. Our principals will be engaged in that conversation as well. And we really just want, the children, parents, teachers, everyone to understand that in, in this public health crisis, this has been given to us as the best way to curb what is happening. And so we wanted to reinforce that with our kids. So the mask will be reinforced and you know, teacher, our teachers will make sure that students have them. The other thing I wanted to say is when students get on the bus in the morning, if they don't have a mask, we will have masks on the bus for them to take a mask. Also in home room at the beginning of the day, there'll be masks because many of our kids will be carpooled, so they may not be able to get that mask on the bus. We just want to make sure. And then our office will also have masks. As I said on Monday, our nurse's office will have masks because the student must wear a mask to be assessed by the school nurse, especially if they're symptomatic. The next question asks, how soon will 504s be reviewed this year to accommodate children who may have difficulty wearing face masks? 
I know things are busy the first few weeks of classes. And last year, I had to wait a month in the last year. I'm concerned this might be too late in the game. And that's a great question. So students with current IEPs and 504s, again, need that medical documentation saying that they are excluded from the mask order due to their disability. Once that is received, a meeting will be held, a 504 or an IEP meeting, to discuss the accommodations for that particular child. And if the child has diagnosed disability, again, but does not have a 504 IEP, we're asking that they get the medical documentation, reach out to the principal or the counselor. I think it's important that we understand that this is a team decision to talk about what's best for that student. And certainly the medical documentation would be supportive of that, but the team also can come up with some strategies and ideas. So for example, if a mask is not an appropriate strategy, you certainly can use a shield. A face shield might be a, something that a child could do, and maybe it's just in smaller increments than what we might expect um, other students to do. So I think it's important to have that conversation with our families and our students. The question asks, Will face masks be worn for recess at the elementary level? This is, this is a, an area that's sort of difficult because we want our elementary students to run around. They're gonna wanna run around and we wanna support them running around. We certainly don't need to have masks on if we're running around. If students are sitting close together and they're within 15 feet of each, or 15, I'm sorry, 15 minutes, six within six feet, for 15 minutes or more, they're going to need to be masked. But if they're running around and we're, we don't want kids to, to be wearing masks and, and become overexerted with the mask, uh, as much as if, if they're in gatherings, we want the masks. And if they're just playing, running around, they would probably be okay to, to take it off during that time. So there's a question here that actually I think will be better met. We're going to have a separate discussion regarding specific to special education. And this is the question that's being asked. And the reason I'm going to put it for that is because I'm not quite sure of the answer. But the answer, the question is, will the special medical exceptions for face masks apply to the bus as well? Or would those students be asked to drive carpool? I don't believe we'd ask to drive carpool. I think you'd, people will still have op opportunities for transportation. But I'm just not quite sure of the actual answer to that question. I want to be sure that we're we're giving you the best information. So if that was your question, stay tuned for more information regarding that, that separate meeting. And I think that's it for me, unless anyone has any other questions. Questions for Dr. Maloney in regards to face mask? Okay, at this point, we will pause in our presentation for the recording and be right back here momentarily for our next segment. So our next segment is in regards to kindergarten. Of course, we have lots of questions because it is going to be a different format than the other grade levels. I'd like to first respond to a couple questions and then Mr. Barrett's going to respond to a few in regards to some specifics. One of the questions is asking, how long will kindergarten be half day? And I would like to explain the rationale for half day kindergarten. We are able to welcome children in grades first through fifth to school every day because we are utilizing our space and our staff differently. Unfortunately, we do not have the staff to provide that additional support to include our kindergarten students for the full day. When we gave consideration to the number of children and where it would be best to have that half day, we felt it made sense for kindergarten because it is their first experience at school and half day kindergarten was something that in the past, um, what, what was a part of our practice. We certainly look to welcome them back as soon as possible. However, given our limited staff and our limited space, we are unable to welcome kindergarten until we move to phase two. The timeline of moving to phase two was another question posed in this segment. 
And at this point, I cannot provide an exact date. We will be monitoring the effectiveness of our mitigation efforts in phase one and making the transition as soon as possible. With that, I would like to ask Mr. Barrett to respond to the questions in this segment in regards to kindergarten. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett, you're muted. Thank you, I was answering the question too. Thank you, Dr. Malicki. Um, question states, can you describe a kindergarten day? Will the kids remain in the same classroom all day with the kindergarten teacher, since they are in smaller classes? Will they remain in the, in the K wing? How will interactions with classmates look? Will they have itinerants even though the day is shortened? The kindergarten, uh, kindergarten students will remain in the same classroom with kindergarten teacher uh, this is for both AM and PM sessions, and this is across all five elementary buildings in Hempfield. In phase, phase one, students currently will be seated in desks, facing the same direction, facing forward, and separated by six feet. As in any classroom, uh, particularly in kindergarten, students will participate in the lessons. Um, they will have be participate in discussions, share stories, listen to stories, uh, be active in all of the creative um, plans that our kindergarten staff has set up and planned for this upcoming school year. However, looking from the outside in, the difference is the students will be social distance seating at desks six feet apart. Um, that is what the looks of what kindergarten will be. Will they have itinerants at this time with the shortened day running an AM and PM schedule? They will not have itinerants at this time. Um, but they will participate and our kindergarten staff is wonderful at getting the students motivated and that'll be our first and foremost goal is to get students in and get them acclimated to the new environment um, and it's just going to from the outside looking in look different with the six feet of social distancing i don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that or would like me to elaborate any more on my answer Thank you, Mr. Barron. Dr. Connor, there were a few questions in this section. Did you wish to respond to those? Uh, there was one question about when will I know if our child has AM or PM kindergarten? Um, and uh, those communications occurred um, by last Friday. So the, that uh, individual, if you have not received a communication from your school, please call because everybody who has registered for kindergarten has been notified of their AM or PM designation at this point. Also, um, there was a question in regards to, would you consider having kindergarten alternate full days instead of current proposed plans of half day every day? And I believe that you have already addressed that um, and it's in regards to because of the social distancing and, and the number of staff. Um, unfortunately, going full day would take away um, and cause that issue to come right back. I believe that concludes our questions for kindergarten. Thank you to all who responded. Any additional questions from our school board? I'd like to welcome Mrs. Diane Sibitoni and joining us this afternoon. Thank you. We are recording in segments according to the questions so that it provides an easier means for parents to watch shorter segments in the future for specific questions. So we will pause at this point for Dr. Connor to end this segment. The questions in our next segment are in regards to lesson bot. I believe this is an area where there is some confusion just because it is a new device and something that we have not ha been able to use in the past. It is newly created by Cloudcast, a device that our IT director, Mr. Wagner, has been very instrumental in designing and is continuing to design to make it uh, a tool that best meets our needs. 
So I will attempt to provide some information in regards to the questions with Less Than Bot, and we will be providing a recording and even putting some pictures on our website that will be helpful to parents. I think the easiest way to describe Less Than Bot is it is a camera. And if you were to take the camera that's currently in your computer, our cameras that are recording us as we are engaging in this Google Meet, that is a similar device to a lesson bot. The only difference is the camera, the footage that is captured through that camera is automatically provided to the students assigned to that course in that particular period of time. So it does make it very user-friendly for our teachers. So our first question is, will every elementary student be sent home with a Chromebook nightly that is set up with lesson bot? So LessonBot is a device that the teacher will use to record, and the recordings will be accessible to students through their Google Classroom. So students will not be taking home a LessonBot. However, our Chromebooks, we are going to be distributing to students in grades three through 12. Our students in grades kindergarten, first and second will use the devices at school, unless we have to become totally remote, and then we will provide one-to-one -one devices for all students. The next question, on the days that elementary students would be in the gym watching LessonBot, would they be able to stay home and watch from there instead? So the LessonBot is used to record segments of lessons. So if a teacher were to begin a lesson, he or she may do a brief demonstration, welcome the class, set the stage for learning for that particular day there will be learning that will occur following the recording. It's possible LessonBot will just be used for a few brief minutes at the beginning of the lesson. It could be used in the middle, certainly, and also at the end of the lesson. The engagement, the work that's going to occur in the middle is what is most important. So therefore, it is important that our students be at school on a regular basis. Um, this question was posed for um, students in grades one through five. So we do want them to come to school daily because the learning that they will receive through LessonBot is only a segment of our instruction. The next question is, please explain how LessonBot works. And this we will demonstrate um, in a video here in the near future. And again, the best way to think of it is it's a camera. The teacher determines what part of his or her lesson will be recorded and viewed as a video that the student will access through their Google Classroom. So students who are at home on the AB days will be able to use Google Classroom to access any videos their teacher is sharing through LessonBot. And teachers may choose to generate videos using other means and posting them in that fashion as well. The next question is, my middle school child wants to know if there will be a way to ask questions on her virtual learning days during the lesson. We are presenting this afternoon using what's called a Google Meet, and many individuals are very familiar with Zoom. This is very similar to Zoom. Our school district chooses to use Google Meet instead because only the individuals who are provided the link have access to our Google Meet. And knock on wood, we have not had any issues with the Zoom bombing that we were hearing of in other locations. So we um, do believe that Google Meet is secure. So, if a student were at home on his or her virtual day, the lesson bot is a one-way recording that the teacher would be sharing information and unable to interact with the students through the lesson bot. However, as of now, we are in a Google, um, Google Meet. I'm able to hear questions. If I were the teacher, I could hear Dr. Connor's question and respond to him. So students will have engagement through Google Meet. The next question, how are teachers going to be able to protect student confidentiality with live teaching? So we did share with our teachers a video that demonstrates the use of LessonBot. LessonBot will be a tool to record the teacher. The model that we shared um, was actually our IT director, Mr. Wagner. And in the recording, you can only see Mr. Wagner and the board that is behind him. So students would not be recorded in LessonBot. And then we hear um, some questions in regards to what if the teacher says a student's name? What if one student says another student's name? 
That information is directory information and there is no expectation for privacy in a classroom. So therefore that information is not protected by confidentiality. We will not be sharing information that is protected, that is confidential, such as student records or student grades, that information will not be shared. Just as our school buses do record audio and visual, we will be um, reminding our parents that our classrooms will also be auditory and visual. So there's not that expectation of privacy. I relate it to if you go to the mall, someone can very easily use their cell phone and do a recording and you know you're in a, a public place and there's no expectation of privacy. But for our classrooms, our teachers will be um, using the lesson bot to share information that will not be protected confidential information. And we will be informing our parents um, through our handbooks and through this, this platform that there should not be an expectation of privacy that a student's first name may be mentioned, last name, that would be directory information. And I wanna to share too, when we did our demonstration, um, Dr. Connor, Dr. Maloney, Mrs. Bryant and I acted as students and we were seated in various places in the classroom. Mr. Wagner had to repeat our questions just because it was not really clear as to what we were saying. Now there are some improvements being made to the sound aspect, but still we do not view it as though someone watching the lesson bot from home will be able to understand or hear much of what's going on in the classroom. It's really geared for what the teacher is presenting. The next question, who do I contact? Um, how do I contact each building to inform them that I want my children to stay in the hybrid program, but not attend in-person classes for a few weeks? So if you want to be a part of our cyber program, that's the information that Dr. Connor shared. And then our other alternative, and there are multiple grade level, levels listed here, so I'm not sure which grade level specifically is being referenced. So it's either one of those two hyper options, if it's for secondary, a cyber options if it's secondary, or the alternating in person for our secondary. The next question, will kids at home still be able to interact in class? by asking questions if they don't understand something. If not, how are they supposed to get answers to questions they may have? And what if the students can't hear? So through LessonBot, the teacher, we're looking at lapel microphones so that that recording will be clear. So the students should not have an issue hearing the teacher's information and directions or demonstrations using LessonBot. And Google Meet, as we're using here, we can certainly hear one another. There are also other means to ask questions. Many times teachers use um, Google Docs, they may use email, they may use a chat feature that's available here for interactions to occur. Those are all tools that we have teachers with various levels of expertise that will be supporting one another as we open school and use, using those tools. The next question during phase two, when all children attend school every day, will the lesson bot still be available for students who do not wish to attend brick and mortar school. The cyber options that Dr. Connor shared, the visual of the program that's available for elementary and the two programs for secondary, those programs will be available year long. Will classes be recorded in real time? Will classes be in real time or recorded? It is a recording with a slight delay. So what will be viewed at home may be a few seconds behind real time but it will be accessible within a very reasonable amount of time. It will also be recorded, and that may be very beneficial for students who are even physically in class or at home, that they would be able to watch that a second time if needed. Is LessonBot easy to understand and will there be a tutorial? We're looking um, at supporting our teachers in the use of LessonBot since it's a teacher tool, and our teachers will work with students on those alternating days when they're physically present at school to support them and using Google Classroom in order to access all of their classroom materials. The next question, what if a student loses their connection to LessonBot during class? How do they get the information? So the recording would be available for them um, once they had access once again. Um, the next question, we seem to be relying on the lesson bot for the success of the school year. Has it been tested? Have teachers been trained in using it effectively? Has it been used in other districts? 
So it is a new tool. We're very excited to have this as a new tool. And because it is being developed by Cloudcast, they are working very closely with us. Um, we are um, testing as we're putting it into place. And really, when you look at LessonBot is a camera. I think the, um, the beauty of the, the use of LessonBot, uh, the tool, is the fact that it automatically syncs with our Skyward system. So it makes it teacher friendly and that the teacher is not identifying which students need to see which videos. It's automatically connected to the students who are rostered for that class. Um, more questions in regards to what does it look like? So certainly we will provide a video. I think that would be the most supportive way. And again, if it's just viewed as a camera, I think that makes it the easiest, a, a camera that is a tool used by the teacher. The next question, how much time will students be receiving in-person teach teaching versus on lesson bot throughout the elementary school day? So certainly that will be a, a brief segment of the lesson. But we know, especially with elementary children, they need active engagement, hands-on. So the video of LessonBot will be utilized many times just to set the stage, provide direction, um, demonstrations. We will be developing an FAQ, and we can link a video that will assist in being able to view what, what it looks like and also to answer any other questions. I will pause just to see if there are any questions from any of our school board members in regards to LessonBot. Hearing none, we will pause at this point for Dr. Connor to end our recording for this segment. Our next segment is in regards to monitoring student and staff health. And Dr. Maloney will be responding to the questions that we have received in this category. Thank you, Dr. Maloney. Thanks, Dr. Maloney. Good afternoon, everybody. We had a lot of questions in this section and we had a large number of questions. Many of them were very similar. What will happen if we have a positive case, if it's a student or a staff? So I'm going to, answer some of the questions and then share some proposed policy and um, administrative regulation changes that are on the board agenda for Monday that you can also find if you have further questions. So the first question, what would happen if a student in a classroom would test positive for COVID? Does the whole class, bus, et cetera, quarantine? At what point would the school close for numerous cases? And that's a great question, and that is the most popular question that was asked. The answer to that is any positive case, the Department of Health will reach out to us and let us know that a, a person with a positive COVID test who was infectious during school, that we would need to contract trace, we would need to find out who those people were, and we would need to make sure that they were quarantining. We also can reach out to the Department of Health and ask if we have a a presumptive case or a probable case where we were concerned about a student or a staff member, we can reach out and talk to Department of Health as well. It's important to note the difference between a known case, which is a positive identified case through Department of Health, and a presumptive case, which may be a person who's symptomatic, maybe known exposure, but we don't have a positive case. And so that makes it tricky, which I said Monday night. That what I want to show you. I'll share my screen. We have an AR under communicable diseases slash attendance. And we, we have this AR, it's an administrative regulation that tells us about different, different diagnoses and, and time students need to be off based on that. So under CDC guidelines and what, what reflects our plan, what also reflects what we're telling staff, and I did also speak to Dr. Masterson, who is our school physician, to make sure that this was all up to date and he, he was in agreement with this. So a symptomatic student, or remember this is a diagnosed patient who has COVID diagnosis positive test. If they are symptomatic, they can participate in remote learning while they're out, if they're well, and then they can come back to school. This is another big question. Three days, 72 hours, since recovery with no fever or fever reducing medications. Improvement of respiratory symptoms 
and 10 days since their first symptom. So those, all three of those need to be in place in order for the student to come back to school. An asymptomatic student can participate in remote learning while out if they feel well enough. So this is a student who has a positive test for whatever reason, but is not symptomatic. The student can return 10 days since their first positive test if they do not subsequently develop symptoms since their positive test. So that's important to note. The next thing to keep in mind is that students and staff who have known exposure, so that means that they were within six feet for more than 15 minutes to a positive case. Those students and staff must quarantine for 14 days. That's a minimum. And that, again, that close contact means that they were within six feet of a person who is a known case for more than 15 minutes. I know that's confusing. We, in our plan, it's, it's outlined there for you so you can look at it. But that's where it gets difficult because we're not always going to have a known case. We might have a presumptive case. And so we have to really intervene, intervene in terms of communicating with those positive cases. We'll take guidance from the Department of Health just like we do with all of those other communicable diseases. Anytime a communicable disease is, is indicated in our schools, we get the Department of Health, we get their guidance, we follow their guidance. So hopefully that helps a little bit with that question. It's a, it's a hard question for me to answer very explicitly because it's really going to depend on the case, the kid, the space, the time. So the next question asks, and this is another very popular question and a very good question. Kids get ill in school often, as well as members in the home that the school will not be aware of, but child doesn't show symptoms until midday, which happens. How will illness, common cold, fever, stomach ache, et cetera, be monitored? And what will be the new protocol for students to return back to school? So the teacher, we will have a protocol in place where if a child becomes ill in a classroom, the teacher will fill out a nursing assistance protocol. They will ask for the child to be seen. And if they're symptomatic, the nurse will be in PPE. The child will need to wear a mask during assessment. And as I said, Monday, they'll be taken directly to a sick area away from the well area where some of our children might be getting medication or diabetic management. So in that, in that situation, they'll be assessed. And what I'd like to share is this document that we are going to be using, our school nurses will be using, and it aligns with our standing orders from Dr. Masterson that really looks at what does, what's happening. So do you have a temperature? Are you taking medication for the temperature? And then we look at the group, the the symptoms in two groups. So if a student has a fever, a cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, they're automatically going to be sent home. If they have two or more of the other symptoms, sore throat, runny nose congestion, chills, new lack of taste or smell, muscle pain, nausea or vomiting, headache and diarrhea, then they go home, um, two or more of those symptoms. So this came from Department of, of Health. Again, it aligns with our standing orders from Dr. Masterson. And, and so hopefully that will clarify a little bit for people in terms of when we might need to send children home. It's important to note that some of these symptoms appear like the common cold, appear like allergies. The unfortunate part is we can't determine for sure that that's what's going on. So if a child is sent home, we will be asking that they be seen by a medical professional. And certainly if your child has allergies or any of those things, your, your doctor will be aware of that and will be able to help you. Another question that, that came up a lot was what if you have a child with chronic illness or allergies or different things that might appear symptomatic? My, what I would recommend is have a conversation with your doctor regarding that before coming to school and seeing if there's anything that, that you need to do to alert us. But again, because there's so much overlap with symptomology of all of these different things, we wouldn't want to not have a child assessed if they were symptomatic and then they end up being positive because, and we didn't send them home and now we have a situation. So we really want to be very cautious, especially at the beginning of this, while we're trying to see what's, what this looks like and how, what's happening. 
But if your child is symptomatic, we certainly, especially with fever, any of those first category issues, fever, cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, you know, please don't send them to school. If they have any of these other two as well, please you know, don't send them to school because we'll have to send them home. And, and I know for some people that that might be difficult getting them to where they need to go. So another question asks about if a student does appear to be sick, regardless of if it seems to be COVID related, will they be required to stay home for 14 days? And again, we'll assess, our nurses will make a determination that the child may need to go home, but we would ask the child to be, to be assessed by a medical professional outside of our nurses and then determine what would be the best course of action. And then that can be communicated back to the school nurse about what is, what is the doctor's, does the doctor feel the symptoms are enough that they need to be evaluated? Is it, does it, does something else make sense? Did they do a different test and determined it was flu? Whatever, uh, that would be very beneficial. The next question asks, if we do need to quarantine our children for two weeks, what are the procedures to easily transition to online learning? So that really is an easy answer. Because of LessonBot, students can be marked present for participating in LessonBot. What we would want from you is communication that that is the situation. So if your child is being quarantined for any reason, we need to know that. But then we also will need to let the teachers know not to expect the child on that AD schedule. What I want to show you for that is in our attendance policy, in the proposed attendance policy, we did, cons we did add language that indicates that students will be considered present if they are participating virtually, hybrid schedule, quarantine illness, even educational field trips by demonstrating attendance by participation. So this is an important piece that was recommended by PDE and we were able to capture. So this is again on the board agenda. You can read this one and then there's actually, this is the actual policy and then the same with the AR. We updated both to include the virtual learning for our students. The next question asks, daily monitoring. How will you monitor the health of the kids and staff? Parents and staff, we're asking you to take temperatures at home to monitor the symptoms of your student. If your student is symptomatic, we ask that you please let us know that, either through the building principal or the school nurse. We want, we're not going to be taking temperatures in the mornings, and we are not going to have a formal symptom screening daily. So it really is important that we partner with you in order for you to keep us informed of any issues that may be happening at home. And I think that's really it. The next question asks about attendance. What will the official attendance policy be for the school year, especially considering the students should not come to school if they fail a health screening? So I, Dr. Wilicki had mentioned in an earlier segment we did just receive some new guidance from PDE regarding attendance and some systems that we can put in place to easily capture our students who are in virtual learning. So we are working on that. We don't have a, an exact answer, but we are, that is in the work. The next question asks, I was wondering how often staff from all levels will be tested. Being involved in foster care caseworkers require one negative test and then require another negative two weeks later before they can be with children. Will all staff be tested before the opening of school? At this time, we are not testing students or staff or conducting any kind of routine testing. The other thing I wanted to mention is in a quarantine situation, I know sometimes it seems like you can, if you are a known risk, so you've been in contact, close contact with a person who's positive and you don't, you don't, you feel asymptomatic, because the, the guidelines are 14 days quarantine. Even if you have tests, tests coming back negative, you still have to do that minimum 14 days quarantine. So I wanted to make sure I was clear about that because I spoke to Dr. Masterson about that, um, that 14 days is required. The next question asks, based other states, based on outbreaks in elementary schools, for example, Georgia and Mississippi, have these cases been reviewed to determine if there are any lessons to be learned to prevent similar occurrences? And to be honest, we don't have a lot of information. We did 
researched this a little bit. We weren't able to gather a whole lot of information regarding the plan or the mitigation procedures that were in place for those, those locations. If this author of this question would like to forward any information, we're always interested in taking anything into consideration. And that would be great. The next question asks, if a child or teacher has symptoms, will the school do a test? As I said, uh, the school will not do a COVID test. The second part of the question is, can we refuse testing on our children? We would not be doing any testing on your children. So I wanted to be clear on that one. The next question asks, and this is an important question, it's a little different regarding attendance. How will attendance work this year? I understand that students can miss 10 days, and then we begin to receive letters or a referral to CYS is made. I prefer to be cautious and keep my kids home this year for a common cold, et cetera, without taking them out to doctors to get an excuse. Are more than 10 days absent permitted without consequences? We need to be able to make these decisions for our kids due to the pandemic. Also, as a teacher in a different school, if I'm exposed, do my children need to quarantine as well? How will this affect their attendance? So lots of great questions. The first part of the question asks about the 10 days. The 10 days is actually under compulsory um, compulsory attendance laws. So those days at this time have not been lifted. We as a district will work with families that we know if, if children have cold-like symptoms or flu or things that are going on and they can't be in school, we will work with families to try to help them. The other thing to keep in mind is the child will only be considered absent if they're not in school and they have not participated in lesson bots. So due to lesson bots availability, that some of those days that used to not count, used to count towards that 10 days, may be lifted because the child is actually able to participate if they feel well enough in the lesson bot activities and be considered present for the day. That might be helpful. In terms of the 10 days being lifted, at this point, they, it has not been. In March, from March to May, that was lifted, but it is not at this time. It's back in place. Uh, this parent asks, also asks, if, you're, if, if a person is exposed, a parent, so this is broader than just being another school, but if a parent is exposed and is in the quarantine, that is a question for Department of Health. Department of Health will indicate whether or not if, if, you, if you're exposed and you're quarantined, does that mean your children are also quarantined? Typically, that's considered a contact of a contact and not necessarily, but I can't say yes or no. It would depend on the situation. So, so if you are positive though, then absolutely your children would be quarantined. How will this affect their attendance again? If they can utilize the lesson bot to be present, then that the attendance issue is not a, not a concern at all. The next question asks about the travel quarantine. My understanding is the district will not require families to travel to quarantine for 14 days as some of the PA guidance suggests. I understand that even travel to a state with a high rate can be low if you limit interaction with others socially distance and wear a mask. However, there are activities that would be high risk. Can, can the district provide some guidance for situations where quarantine would be recommended? So we are not enforcing a travel quarantine, but I will share with you in our meeting with Excella doctors on Monday, one of the things they talked about that's important to hear is that it's, it's not so much the place you go, but, but how you act and the mitigation efforts that you keep while there. So, if you feel that you were in large crowds and unable to social distance and perhaps in a place where the mitigation efforts were very difficult for you to complete, then you may want to do a quarantine. If you were able to do those, you know, socially distance, stay within your, not, you know, get takeout at restaurants, there's, there's a list of things that you can do, I think, on the, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Health website that talks about the mitigation efforts you can do on vacation, then, then you certainly don't have to. We, we can't really enforce this because we don't know what your experience was. And it would be very difficult for the district to determine one experience over another. So we're really asking you to make those decisions with your families and, and when you're on vacation to determine what's best practice. Dr. Maloney, if I can just interject to share yeah. that. The travel Please. quarantine is currently in place for our athletes yes. as part of our current um, phase one and phase two, Mr. Rep. I believe it's in both phases. And we are meeting next week, the athletic committee meeting. So that may change as the committee meets and has new recommendations and approves the next segment of our plan. 
on August the 17th. And Mr. Rapp, correct me if I did not share something accurately. No, that is that's accurate. Uh, and, and again, just with the understanding that uh, you know we are currently in a voluntary state uh, with our athletic programs at this point, we have not uh, reached um, the mandatory portion of that season. That, and so we'll address that as as we look to incorporate additional phases. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Maloney. Yep. Just wanted to yep. clarify that piece. We talked about that because we did talk about that on Monday. Yes. So the next question. I told you it was a lot. Student confidentiality, how will student confidentiality be maintained according to HIPAA when the proposed plan includes the expectation that the school be informed of students who have tested positive for COVID or even are just experiencing general symptoms? So it's important to understand that the school district under the under FERPA, the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act, which does protect student information and student data, students will never be named in contact tracing or notification. So that's important. And again, this goes back to that same process that we follow for all of our communicable diseases. So if a child has chicken pox or if we have whooping cough, those are things that we follow DOH guidance and we never name students. So that's important to note. And really we would follow the DOH guidelines on who to notify and how to notify them. I know that's a really hard question for parents here. They, I know people want more information on that, but it really is going to depend on the case where the student was, how long it's been since they were in the building infectious versus when they got their test results back. So we will always be as transparent as we possibly can be, but we will absolutely maintain our students' confidentiality of uh, information. And I think that's it for me. Any questions for Dr. Maloney in this regard? Thank you, Dr. Maloney. Excellent Thank job. Thank you. We will pause for our recording and then return for the next segment. And we are ready for the next segment of our town hall meeting. Dr. Connor, I believe we are moving to transportation, correct? That is correct. So we have several questions in that regard. I will be responding to most of them. I believe there's one that I've asked Mrs. Charlton um, to join as well as Dr. Connor for a few. So the first question is, are there going to be staggered times the children are called to carpool? Fort Allen, Mr. Barrett, your school has a lot of children all ready for carpool. I think every elementary school does. So how will the times of dismissal work? Are we going to be using an app for dismissal? And the um, response to that is yes. Last year, West Point piloted, I believe it was called Pick My Kid, was the name of the app. We have purchased that for use across all elementary schools. And we are starting dismissal at 3.30 rather than 3.45, which does allow for some staggered times because we do know that carpool lines get extremely long. The next question, are kids going to be seated one person on a bus? That is our goal, one child per seat. I talked to Mr. Coniglio earlier today in this regard. Um, he is working on the routes. And certainly with a district our size, that is quite a challenge. There may be the need, especially at the elementary, to have two children in a seat. And we will work with our building principals to look to see if they can be siblings if there's a need for children to be seated together. We are going to really be monitoring uh, the number of children on our buses. The half day kindergarten, the children will be rostered for both the morning and the afternoon. So our numbers may appear that there are more children on the bus, but we know with the half day kindergarten that will not have every child. And the current fluctuation of enrollment in our cyber school is really um, another area where we have to watch because we know that will reduce our number of children on our school buses. Will the children have to wear masks on the bus? The response is yes. Unfortunately, they um, will not be six feet apart for social distancing. So we will uh, require masks to be worn on the school bus and they will be available if a child arrives at the bus stop and does not have a mask. The next question, I'm deeply concerned about the mask. My father was a bus driver. Um, certainly the heat created issues and has concerns with the bus driver and students passing out um, with the heat. 
The bus windows can be dropped. I talked to Mr. Coniglio again earlier today, and the buses have vents on the top that will be lifted as well. And the guidance that Dr. Maloney shared was the requirement to wear face masks unless it would be something that would create a danger, something that in which you could not complete a task. So the drivers will have their mask on when the students are boarding and unboarding the bus as they're walking um, directly past the driver. But if there is an issue where the driver has a concern such as passing out from the heat, they would be able to, under the guidance, to remove the mask for that period of time. Let's hope for a fall that's not, not so hot. The next question, when will information be available for the carpool start times for both drop-off and pickup so parents can arrange schedules accordingly um, with the new start times and staggered dismissal at the elementary school? So a lot of questions around what time. I want to be clear, our school hours will remain the same for high school and middle school. There will be no changes. The elementary is where we had to make some additional um, time available for the staggering of arrival and dismissal. Our elementary buses may still arrive as early as 8.30, but because we will have double runs for some of our buses, we need to allow for that time, and we may not have all children arriving at the school until as late as 9.10, 9.15. Uh, as Mr. Coniglio finishes our routes, which they will be finished next week, we will then be able to give uh, more confirmed information. The postcards that we send each year are to be mailed next Friday, which is August the 14th is our um, date at this point that we are projecting that the postcards um, will be completed and placed in the mail. So that will provide parents with more specific information. If transportation creates an issue with childcare, keep in mind we do have the YMCA program, which you must sign up through the YMCA for before and after school care at all of our elementary schools. I want to take just a quick moment to, to mention that our Westmoreland Community College is sharing a flyer of a program they are offering to parents for students in the middle school on the off day when they're doing virtual learning. The community college, um, for a small fee, is offering for parents to have their student at the college where they will be supervised and assisted as they participate in their online learning. So that would be information if you're looking for child care too take advantage. The next question, since my 10th grader, oh, it is in the CTC. So there was information that was released yesterday, Mrs. Charlton, in regards to the CTC. Yes. Yes. That any parent should be able to get on the district website and see the letter that was released um, just yesterday afternoon for the CTC students. And if you have any questions, just give us a call. Thank you. The next question is asking if we could provide adult monitors on our school buses. Unfortunately, that would be a financial um, issue in having, we have 60 large school buses that run daily. So that would be a cost factor. And it appears that the purpose is to be sure that the students are wearing their mask. The drivers will certainly um, work with students as they always do in regards to following rules and um, relay any concerns to the building principals as they currently do. The next question is in regards to the process for carpool pickup at the middle or high school. And Mrs. Charlton, perhaps you could address how carpool will be handled at the high school. When we have carpool at the end of the day at the high school or even at the beginning of the day, it, the traffic can be difficult. Um, at the end of the day, all of the parents are to drive up Spartan Lane at the back of the school drive up around the back side of the field house and and the press box, come down the, the road beside the stadium, make the left between the stadium and the school, then make the right up the back up at the back side of the building. Um, and I know it's been very congested and crowded in the past. Hopefully it'll be better this year because many of our students have the opportunity to leave early this year and more students have taken that opportunity than we have had in the past. So many of the students who will be dismissed at that time will, many of them will already be gone. They will be going to opportunities for internships. They will be going to WCCC or taking classes other places. So I think that you will see some relief in terms of the just the number of cars that will be leaving. 
The only thing that we request is that you not pull into the traffic lanes where the students are parking because then they can't pull out. Um, they can't back up, they can't pull out, and they can't get out. The other thing that we have done to try to relieve the traffic in the back of the building is that all of the teachers will be parking in front of the building this year, with the exception of a few that will be parking up at the small parking lot above the um, up, up the hill on the driveway by the tennis courts. So there will not be any teachers parking in the same area as the students who are, are parking in the student parking lot. So hopefully these changes will remediate some of the traffic congestion that we have had at the backside of the high school. Thank you, Mrs. Trump. You're welcome. Another question we have is, will the buses run different routes and times? The routes will primarily be the same and the times will be available on your postcard, which we again look to release next Friday. Um, the buses will be cleaned daily. That was a question and carpool we did answer. As far as driving to the CTC, that was also answered in the communication that Mrs. Mash uh, released yesterday. We mentioned the carpool app and the bus stop schedules. Dr. Connor, any other questions on there that we missed? The only one I, I noticed is that uh, there's a question specifically if a student is at a bus stop without a mask, will entry be denied? Will ex extra masks be available on the bus? And I believe Dr. M Maloney uh, reviewed that in her section very uh, eloquently explaining that um, there will be math available on the bus for those students um, as they enter as well. I think that's it. Oh, the other one, one ch our, ch ch uh, our children ride one bus in the AM and another in the PM. Is that still allowed? And yes, uh, we still accommodate um, different uh, arrangements for families um, based on guardianship, et cetera. Thank you. So with that, we will conclude this segment for transportation and return for one more segment. Pause momentarily, thank you. believe we're good, Dr. Connor. You're on mute, just give me a thumbs up. Okay, so we do have questions in regards to special education and we have decided to respond to those at a future date. Mrs. Bryant will be doing a similar meet and we will post that segment along with all the other segments that we have recorded from this afternoon. We have one final segment that we are going to respond to this afternoon. And this segment is under the category of other. So certainly there were some questions that we may have already addressed. So Dr. Connor and I have chosen a few that we are going to respond to at this time as our final segment. Dr. Connor, do you want to begin? I will definitely try. I like to plan ahead for everything and the uncertainty of everything makes that very difficult. My child is heading into first grade and with the limiting of sharing of items, can supply lists um, be sent out sooner than later? I've been picking up random supplies, but I would like to actually get what she needs um, in advance. And um, of course, we understand uh, it, it is wonderful if we can um, work ahead, get ahead of the crowds, especially um, at Walmart, Target, et cetera. And we will do our best to make sure we share those lists as soon as we can. Um, what was mentioned at the very, very beginning of our presentation, we are trying to accommodate and um, adjust to the plans as they go. So um, we just wanna make sure that we have everything we know and we need um, so we don't communicate uh, to the families that they're, they need to bring something or send something with their child. That's definitely not necessary. Next question. You said that children in the elementary were going to spread out during the course of the day. However, you never explained how the day was really going to work, how much time they'll actually spend in their homeroom what will happen while in other makeshift classrooms. And 
Um, so at this time, what I would like to do is share um, share my screen again. Just bear with me, please. And what you see in front of you is a sample example fourth grade schedule from one of our buildings. And um, please know that this is just an example so that this is not something to um, um, get bent out of shape about and this is not what your child will exactly be following. But I wanted to um, show this visual to help um, maybe cement the fact of how um, our school will work at the elementary level. So at the top, you'll see uh, for this fourth grade schedule, this is a two teacher team. Some of our buildings, as you may know, have four person teams at grade levels, and some of them may have three person teams. So that there will be variance when we look at this. But when we look at the top of the schedule, um, if you look and it says home room, this is what a kid would typically experience and what their schedule will kind of look like uh, with one of those teachers throughout the school day. Um, from 940 to 1110, they'll experience their English language arts. I want you to notice right across from that, at that very same time, for a majority of the lesson, we have designated LessonBot to participate in ELA. So in other words, if you scroll down on this page, you'll notice that there'll be students that, um, well, first, let me take a step back. What we have done is we have taken our classrooms and we have divided our classrooms into small groups. So you'll notice there's a group A, group B, group C. In this building, we've divided our homerooms into thirds, okay? So when I talk about that, these small groups turn out to be about 12 to 16 kids total. And you'll notice that um, it's a, a rotation is a six day cycle. So they'll go through this. Um, day one, they may receive their instruction in the gymnasium in that classroom setting. However, day two and day three, they'll be back in a homeroom setting. You'll notice they'll rotate to day four, they'll be with the title teacher or an itinerant teacher for their uh, instruction. And then back day five and day six, they're back in the homeroom. So um, I know that was a rumor out there that students would be stuck in a gymnasium all week receiving instruction. And that is not correct. We want students to be able to rotate through. We want students to um, see all of our um, itinerant teachers as well. Because what's important is that this schedule, not in the home room that you see here, while the student is participating in their ELA classroom through lesson plot, through the Google Classroom platform, as we described earlier, if you notice down here, the itinerant or reading lessons can occur and start at this time. They're going to have extra time with their itinerant. So for this rotation, they'll have their phys ed classes. If you scroll down this week, which is on the second six day cycle, they'll have their art classes. This week, they'll have their library classes. This week, they'll have their technology classes. In a typical elementary classroom schedule over a six day cycle, they get their itinerants one day out of the six day cycle. What we've done is they're getting their, they're getting their itinerants all week over a six week um, stretch. I hope that makes sense. I, and I, I know it's kind of hard to envision. Um, I know Mr. Barron probably eats this up. Um, he, so, he loves his scheduling, but I wanted to kind of give our parents a little picture as to what it looked like. The next question uh, is in regards to where will the public be able to view our district plan? So our board agenda will be released if it has not already here by 4.30 in a few minutes and the plan will be attached all 68 pages. So if you're looking for something to read over the weekend, that would um, be a great document. We will also be posting it on our website once it is board approved. I asked Mrs. Charlton also to respond to a question that we have in regards to lockers at the high school. Um, there are we are fortunate in one way. Our population has declined over the years so that in the past, all of our sophomores and all of our freshmen shared lockers. We no longer need to do that. Each student is assigned their own locker. 
Now, your child may choose to allow his or her friend to use his locker or her locker, but that is not necessary and every child will have their own locker. So if you find that they're telling you that they have a locker partner, um, give us a call and we'll straighten that out because they don't need to do that. Dr. Rilke, there were a few questions where parents asked for visuals of what the classrooms look like, what the spaces look like. And we are working, um, I, I'm not sure if any, anybody out there realizes that Dr. Rilke is a star from w WTAE News. They were here to film mm -hmm. her um, this past week uh, down at West Hempfield Elementary. They also filmed several of those spaces. So um, although it was on the news that night, uh, we are hoping to get a clip of that back from them so we can post it for families to see. I believe I was the only superintendent who answered my phone, so I will learn. So our next question is, why, do the, why does the school district find it safe to allow thousands of kids to go back to school as normal, but we are unable to have in-person meetings? So the, the reason we are holding this meeting virtually is certainly with 400 responses, we believe we would have more than 25 people show up for a meeting if we were to hold this in person. The current restrictions limit indoor meetings to 25, and as we all know, outdoor at 250. So we did not choose to have an outdoor meeting today to invite 250 people. So we chose to do this virtually. And it also provides us the opportunity then to have the recordings for individuals who are unable to watch it in person today. Our board meetings are the same. We are limited to 25 and hold them in the manner that we do for that reason. Another question is, will the district go back to traditional grading methods or continue to use the pass-fail grading standards? So we really did not use pass-fail. We did have a minimum fail percentage, but we are not planning to continue that practice. That was under some extreme circumstances. And with all the planning and preparations that we have, we will resume our regular grading practices for the 2020-21 school year. Will our children still have police protection at the schools? Yes, we have not made changes. Um, if you're looking at our board agenda, you may see we have one officer going to full-time while another going to part-time, but our number of officers has remained the same at this point. And there has been no discussion or consideration of reducing officers. Dr. Connor, any others that we did not address under the other category? I don't see anything that's specific. Uh, there is a question in, in regards to communication and um, a more efficient way to communicate with parents via mobile application or format. Um, and I think this parent does not in, enjoy receiving the remind communications and the website posts and the emails. Um, and the, the issue with that, and sometimes I, I, I think sometimes we, we are worried that we don't cover all of our bases. And um, really, we want to make sure that when we communicate information home, especially at this um, unprecedented time, that it gets home to everybody um, in a necessary format. So I do apologize in advance if you receive it multiple times um, in, in various formats, but we feel that that communication is so necessary in um, ensuring that all of our families are informed and um, that we can educate our, our children and our families of what our next steps are. We are using Facebook. If you have not liked us on Facebook, please follow. Um, that is a means we know that many parents utilize and Mrs. Gibasevich is doing a wonderful job keeping our page up to date. We had received, as I mentioned at the beginning, 400 questions today. And I know that we may not have addressed each and every question. We will review to see where there were some areas that may have been omitted. And we will be creating an FAQ, Frequently Asked Question document and posting that on our website so that we can continue to provide updates. The information we shared with you today was based upon what we know at this time. And as we know, there are continuous updates. So as we receive updates, we will continue to refine our plan. I, I do want to take a moment to say thank you to our school board for your support, for being here and joining us for this two hour plus meeting so that our public is aware of your support of our plan. 
I also want to mention that our first day of school is August 27th. I know other districts have given consideration to postponing their start date. We have not had those discussions. And I realize with the first day of school quickly approaching, um, it is not the recommendation of administration to postpone um, our start date. We feel we have put a lot of time, work, effort all summer into our plan, and we will be ready to start school on August 27th. And we will continue to communicate with our school board in regards to any professional development needs that may arise once school begins, if we would need to have an Act 80 day at some point to provide an opportunity for our teachers to have some additional support if needed. And I also want to thank our presenters today. I realized that was a huge time commitment from your schedule with so much to do and preparations for the start of school. So thank you to all for submitting questions for your interest. We will continue to do our best to make the start of the school year as safe for all students. And I do have just one last um, request, and this is actually from a fourth grader at Fort Allen who submitted this letter, and um, we told her we would read it during this, this town hall meeting. I think it, it will be interesting to hear the perspective of a, of a child. Um, I am writing, I'm writing today because I'm worried about a, a lot of people being in one classroom, gym room, five days a week. I think if students go five days each week, COVID-19 could spread easier. It makes me sad to think that my family, teachers, and bus drivers could get sick. My doctor told me that kids don't get as sick as adults, but kids can spread it to adults and they could get really sick. I think the district should consider splitting the classes into two groups and doing online three days and in-person two days. This could help keep COVID-19 from spreading because of better social distancing. My teachers and bus drivers and school staff are like family to me. So the district should do this to keep them safe. Right now, we shouldn't just think about ourselves, we should think about everybody. So I want to thank um, Stella, is the child's first name, for sharing her thoughts. And I hope after today's presentation, we have shared that everyone is very important to us from our bus drivers, our teachers, our students, all school staff. And certainly the measures that we have put in place are to provide social distancing so that we can reduce risk for everyone. It's a monumental task to open school for 5,600 children and to welcome back 700 plus staff members. But with the hard work of our team, the support of our school board, we feel that we have a plan in which we can, and we will certainly monitor the effectiveness of the plan. So with that, I will say thank you to all. Any comments from our school board members prior to closing? Okay, I will see our school board members Monday night at our, our next meeting. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and thank you all. Take care.